Yeah, I'm ready. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this live stream. Uh, my name is Chris Yoki. I'm the Public Programs Director for the Japanese American Museum of San Jose. So I hope everyone's doing well, staying healthy during this, uh, these weird times that we're having. But uh, uh, museum is, uh, we're currently closed. And so right now what we're doing is our programming. We're going to be uh, doing uh, more of these uh, live streams. So, um, yeah, at this point here, it's a little bit new to me here. Um, we're going to uh, address as many questions as we can So uh, during our Q&A. So uh, if you have any questions, if you could just please input them into the uh, Facebook chat. And then we'll, um, uh, we'll read them off during the end. So um, you know, before we get started, I just want to talk a little bit about the JAM's mission statement. And so uh, the museum's mission is to uh, collect, preserve, and share. And what we kind of refer to is the uh, CPS. And we want to collect, preserve, and share the Japanese American history, culture, and arts. So one of the things that come, came from our, our mission statement was the, um, we're able to, to uh, have the Hidden Histories of San Jose Japantown project. Next slide, please. So uh, today's program is the Hidden Histories of uh, San Jose Japantown project, and it's uh, peeking behind the curtain. And so this is going to be episode one, and um, we'll be doing a few more with these, with the uh, hidden history of San Jose, Japan town. So uh, you can see our uh, agenda for today. Um, Susan Hayase will talk about the uh, project origins, augmented reality. Uh, Tom Izu uh, will go to the goals of the hidden histories uh, project. Uh, Kurt Fukuda. You will then show some videos from the project as well as discussing how to document your own videos. And so this will be uh, followed by a Q&A. Uh, so again, um, if you do have any questions, comments, please put them into the chat section. So yeah, enough about me. Let's get down to the good stuff here. So um, I'd like to introduce uh, Susan Hayase. Uh, Susan is one of the co-directors of the Hidden Histories of San Jose Japantown project. So let me get out of your way here, Susan. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, before we start, I, I wanna say on behalf of the Japanese American Museum of San Jose and the Hidden Histories of San Jose Japantown project that we are heartbroken at the death of George Floyd and the many black people who have been killed by the police, including in San Jose. And we condemn the systemic racism that these killings represent. We feel strongly that meaningful acts of justice and accountability are required right now. And we hope this moment represents a turning point for this country and for all its people. As organizations that value local community history, we also value life and the aspirations and relationships that are represented in that history. As a country, we want people to be intent on creating a history that's full of life, love, joy, as well as justice and the truth. Now I want to talk about um, Tamiko Thiel, who provided a lot of the inspiration for the Hidden Histories Project. She's the driving artistic force behind our augmented reality project. Tamiko Thiel is an internationally recognized digital media artist who explores the interplay of place, space, the body, and cultural identity in works, encompassing a supercomputer, objects, digital prints, videos, interactive 3D virtual worlds or VR and augmented reality as both gallery installations and as art in public place. Her work has been exhibited internationally in venues such as the Museum of Modern Art or MoMA and the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York, the Istanbul Biennial, the International Center for Photography in New York, the Design Museum in the Pinakothek der Modern Munich, 
the Institute of Contemporary Art in London and Boston, the ZKM in Karlsruhe, the Tokyo Metropolitan Museum of Photography, the Fondazione Chiarini Stampaglia in Venice, and the Centre Pompidou in Paris. She has also lectured and taught internationally. I am so lucky to have met Tomiko when we were both students at Stanford and when we were both young women engineers at Hewlett Packard. So Tomiko has been doing augmented reality artwork and she's helped us bring that to San Jose. So what is augmented reality and what is AR? Um, the example that most people recognize is the smartphone game called Pokemon Go. That's an app that has people looking through their smartphone camera for cartoon creatures that exist only in the app in some location. But AR is not just for games. Augmented reality is a mobile app technology that overlays computer generated information, which is sounds, images, text, or a school of fish on the camera view of the real world around you. Using the Rpoise app, which was developed by Tomiko and Peter Graff, your smartphone can be transformed into an AR art scope that reveals hidden place-based AR artworks that can only be seen in a particular place. The artwork is related to the place. So here are some examples of some AR artworks that Tomiko has done. This one is called Evolution of Fish. Evolution of Fish is an augmented reality large projection that turns the surroundings outside on building facades or inside on gallery walls into an underwater reef filled with schools of fish. People can use their smartphone or iPad to guide the fish around the space, but the more they intervene in the virtual ecosystem, the more the fish start turning into plastic garbage. Originally created for the Digital Graffiti Festival in the Florida Gulf Coast, the installation includes large silvery amberjacks, game fish known for their love of debris, and the colorful reef fish that will become more common on the Florida Gulf Coast as they migrate northward due to warming waters. So frequently we ask, how did Westerners see Asia and what did Westerners want there? Spices, silk, etc. But we don't often think of what Asians thought of the West. This view is hidden. Tamiko reveals this through augmented reality. The faces floating in the air in this augmented reality work are actually depictions by Japanese artists of what they thought Westerners looked like. The installation is in Salem and Seiram is an imagined Asian pronunciation of that city's name. So what did Asians want from the West? Um, they wanted pieces of eight. They were interested in gold and silver coins. They also wanted sea cucumbers from the local waters. And these ones that you see floating around here are called garlic bread sea cu cucumbers. And they also were interested in poppies for opium. Although at some point, China tried to ban the importation of opium, a policy to which the British responded with military force. Next, um, Tom Izu is going to um, talk to you. He, he's the co-director of um, the Hidden Histories Project. Good afternoon, everyone. The past, this past year, Susan and I asked Tomiko, Tomiko if she'd be willing to present a show um, of her art pieces and do a talk for a benefit I helped organize at the California History Center and the Euphrat Museum of Art at Tianza College. She agreed and suggested that we take advantage of her visit all the way from Germany, where she lives, to also install parts of a piece she and her mother, a master calligraphist, created in 2015 for Seattle, Washington, uh, where she grew up. Tomiko felt that it could make a great demonstration or proof of concept project and help us build support for creating a new project, one we had discussed with her that aimed to bring to life the hidden layers of history connecting the three groups, Chinese, Japanese, and Filipino Americans that have historically shared the Japantown area. The piece entitled 
brush the sky explores sites using AR art renderings of Japanese calligraphy that are important to Tamiko's family and the broader Japanese American community in the area she grew up. Susan had asked Tamiko if there could be a way to use this piece in San Jose, Japantown, since the stylized kanji calligraphy expressed sayings fitting to our area as well. So this became a wonderful excuse to do so. Five of her pieces from the Seattle work were set up in Japantown and are operating right now as a demonstration project. Upon Tamiko's return to Germany, she contacted us and said we should apply to a National Knight Foundation grant for a new project that came to her attention. It's called an Immersive Technology in the Arts Grant designed to encourage museums to experiment with art using AR and virtual reality technology. So on short notice, we decided to apply on behalf of JAMS and to our great surprise became one of five awardees out of some 500 nationwide. Our grant calls for the creation of nine new AR art pieces to be installed in the streets of Japantown that explore and interpret the hidden histories and the interrelationships between Chinese, Japanese, and Filipino-American communities, groups that have shared this historic locale now known as San Jose Japantown. Funds are to be used to recruit a pool of local community-based artists to learn about these hidden histories, to be trained in AR technology, and out of the pool, finalists will be selected to complete the nine art pieces. Our aim is to complete the project by spring 2021 or sooner. Next, we have a video interview of one of our advisors, Tony Santa Ana, who is an educator and artist involved with the Santa Clara Valley chapter of the Filipino American National Historical Society. He explains more about the meaning of the project. J-Town is a very, very special place because it has so much rich history of, of course, the Filipinos, the Chinese, and the Japanese, and probably other cultures that we don't know too much about, or we may. It's also an emerging place for Silicon Valley, where a lot of people are actually going there, moving there, and adding their own flavor to the place. So I got involved because Tom thought that I'd be a good person because I, I had the love for, for history, um, for also for art and also solidarity amongst different groups because we are all in this together and we have to collaborate and have to work together in order to fight for justice and, and fight for the preservation for our communities. Well, this is a very avant-garde um, experimental project and I'm glad that the Knight Foundation was able to fund this because of what it stands for and what it's gonna do and maybe even trend set for different areas of funding for different historical towns across the country. So with the Hidden Histories Project, I really wanna thank Tom again, uh, because for me, it's something that I really want to preserve because it has the intersection of art, is of preservation of culture, of solidarity amongst different groups. I think this is a very special project that a lot of people can learn from and appreciate. And I, I, I hope, and I know it will, will add to the value of what J-Town has offered this community. That was uh, Tony Santana. And now I'd like to go over the goals for our project really briefly. Uh, one is that new horizons for jams. And what we mean by that is you, to help jams use new technologies to encourage future projects of all kinds. Um, the second is to promote unity and protect a historic neighborhood. And what we mean by that is bring together the different people who have shared that community and help them uh, understand the value of uh, Japantown and its history. Uh, engage new audiences. We want the museum to be able to branch out and reach a new demographic, including younger people and others who might not know um, about uh, either any of these communities and as well as bringing some new members from the Chinese and Filipino American communities. Peak interest. We wanna reach visitors to Japantown who might otherwise not know about the history of the area and about our own museum. And so when they're walking around, they'll be able to access this augmented reality artwork. Uh, of course, the last is educate, and that means to promote the importance and power of history and stories as part of the mission of the museum. I'm going to do a quick overview of the people working on this project right now. First, we have our team. 
Um, that's uh, Susan, you already met, and myself as the co-directors, and we're volunteers. And our staff is Kurt Fukuda, who you'll meet very soon, documentarian archivist, and Kareen Takata Okada, who is a community artist, and our supervising community artist is working directly with the artists that are in our art pool. And then we have Susan Yuen, who is our manager um, and our Zoom expert. Uh, next, uh, we have our technical advisors, and you've already met Tamiko Tio, and we have uh, Peter Graf, who's the, um, her husband, who is the person who designed the apps that we're going to be using for the, that we are using for the augmented reality work, and they're very, very important to us. And next, we have our community advisory panel. And um, we have uh, two representatives from the Filipino American community. You already met Tony, and the other is a, a considered an elder, um, Robert Raksak, who is an expert about the history of Filipino Americans in the San Jose area. And I think you'll probably be hearing from him in a future episode because he has some wonderful stories. In the Chinese American community, we have Connie Young Yu. And if she looks familiar, that's, and if you saw the PBS special recently, she was at the beginning as well as the end of it. And she's a historian who's written extensively about Chinese Americans and especially about Heinlandville Chinatown, which was the basis for the formation of Japantown when the Chinese first came here. Brenda He Wong is a member of the Chinese Historical and Cultural Project, and she helps uh, run a uh, replica of the temple that used to be in Heinlandville, the Chinese temple, and they uh, rebuilt it in uh, what is now History San Jose Park. And uh, we last but not least, we have representatives from the Japanese American community in our own museum, Steve Fujita, who is an emeritus professor from Santa Clara University. He's uh, where he was the head of ethnic studies, and he's written many books about the social psychology of Japanese Americans. Last but definitely not least is Gordon Smith, who's the vice president of the Japanese American Museum and the head docent. Now, all of these, um, all of these, uh, these people and their bios are available on our Hidden Hitters Histories website, which I think will be posted in the chat if you want to take a look at it. And last, before I move on, on the website, we will also have, we also have the um, list of artists. We have 17 of them uh, and their own bios, and you might find that interesting to take a look at. Okay, so now we're going to um, move on to our Hidden History video, and I'd like to introduce Kurt Fukuda, who's going to speak. One of the purposes of a project is to collect materials about the history of the three groups in Japantown for use not only for our current work, but for future projects of any kind that JAMS may want to undertake. Kurt Fukuda is in charge of this as our documentarian archivist. He is an accomplished photographer, videographer, and community historian, as well as co-author of San Jose, Japantown, A Journey. Kurt will now talk about his work, especially the videos he has put together for us. Well, thank you, Tom and Susan. And I want to thank Jams for giving me the opportunity to participate on this uh, very exciting project. As Tom said, I'm the documentarian and archivist for the project. Um, as you might guess, recently, my, a lot of my duties are doing screen captures of a lot of Zoom meetings. but. Uh, in addition, there was a need to uh, publicize the project. And one idea was to create informative videos. And the initial videos we produced were uh, about details about the project. Uh, the videos include uh, Tom and Susan explaining about AR and about the goals of hidden histories. You saw a, an excerpt of Tony Santana talking about uh, the project also. And out of these videos, a uh, different set of videos grew out of it. We decided that to produce some videos that contain anecdotes and stories about San Jose, Japantown. And these would get people like really excited about, uh, about the neighborhood and about the project. You know, stories really help us make sense of the world. And they create an understanding and a, a commonality be between people. You know, stories can be very didactic or, or direct, you know, telling you information, or they could be very poetic and touches on a very subconscious or emotional level. Um, with the hidden histories, I really am using the augmented reality art. Um, you know, we're taking more of a pro poetic uh, approach to communicate and excite people about San Jose Japantown. 
Now, right now, the project is focusing on the three main Asian groups that have been a part of the community, the Chinese, the Japanese, and the Filipino. But we welcome stories about all the other important ethnic groups that have been part of the community, including the Italians, the African-Americans, the Hispanic, the Vietnamese, Korean, and other groups that have been a part of the neighborhood. As uh, Tom mentioned, we have a website and the videos that we have produced, you can access on our Facebook page, Instagram, or our YouTube channel. Um, on our YouTube channel, if you, if you go, uh, you know, go to YouTube, do a search on Hidden Histories of San Jose Japantown, you'll be taken to our channel. Um, be sure to click the videos uh, link because the videos link really shows all the videos that we have produced. If you just scroll on the uploads, it only shows you the first uh, 11, the most recent 11 videos that we've produced. And of course, if, you, if you're looking for something specific, uh, you can use our playlists. We've created playlists with different subjects. Uh, now, much of the videos, um, uh, materials that in our videos have come from stories that I've collected over the years. And before moving on to show you a couple of the videos, uh, I've been asked to share a little bit about my background and how I've come to film and collect interviews. You know, I've been interested in the power of stories since I was a little boy. Um, whether these stories come from movies, I love movies, uh, books, radio dramas. I used to listen to radio dramas. I used to read comic books. I used to listen to people telling stories. And, and these stories really opened up for me the richness of the world. They really expanded my worldview and fired my imagination. And this has really stayed with me throughout my whole life. Now, my involvement with uh, Japantown really came about in the mid 80s when I reconnected with a friend, Ellen Beth. Ellen and I had the same art teacher at San Jose High. His name was Mark, was Mark Briggs. Mark Briggs was kind of the teacher's teacher. He really devoted his life to enriching and inspiring his students uh, that they could actually have a livelihood in the arts. Well, Ellen introduced me to the San Jose Taiko. She introduced me to other uh, organizations and projects in San Jose, Japantown. And this really got me excited about the community because I had, I had been completely unaware of the exciting cultural and political things that were happening in San Jose, Japantown. Now, this led me to being involved with the 1990 Centennial. And then later on, coming up with a virtual reality uh, idea with Jim Nagaretta and Janice Oda uh, about San Jose, Japantown. And uh, this virtual reality project never came to fruition, but it morphed into a book which became the Journeys book, a uh, 435 page book about the history of San Jose, Japantown. Now, Jimmy Yamaichi was an early supporter of our project. And he began taking me around to interview a lot of the Nisei. And just filming the Niseis, asking them the questions really got me interested to do more interviews. It really gave me mo the momentum. And uh, so later, with the help of people like Ward Shimizu, Ralph Pierce, and of course, Robert Ragsack, uh, we've uh, continued arranging and conducting interviews and gathering photographs and information. Now, you've already seen an example of the more uh, informational videos that we produce, although like the one with Tony Santana. Now we're going to look at two examples of the hidden history videos that deal more with anecdotes and stories. The first one is a group of Filipinos that I interviewed, uh, telling a little anecdote. And the next one is Dr. Ishikawa, who I uh, Film back in 1990 doing a, a tour and he talks about the first uh, Mrs. Hori and her daughter Alice in Japantown. So this is more about the stories or stories. <laughs> Yes, uh, 
what's his name? Clark Takeda? Yeah, Clark yeah, Takeda. He was the coach for the the Zebras. Yes, yes, yeah. he, he He really built that team up. He was pretty good. Yeah. Did you ever go to his barber shop? Oh, yeah. I used to shine shoes there. Whenever they used to have the Japanese, what is it, Oban? <laughs> yeah. Whatever. Yeah, the I used to shine speak. shoes. I hated to shine these old Japanese guys' shoes <laughs> because they. They wore those old-fashioned shoes that came all the way to the top, yeah. okay? Instead yeah. of just you know, shiny the shoe, it's up. They say, no, 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 all the way up to the top for a lousy nickel, man. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Science were hard. <laughs> Mrs. Horry was a midwife. She had two daughters. They were about eight or nine years older than I was. And uh, one of the daughters married Dr. Nakahara, the dentist. And when he came to San Jose, he opened his office in the front part of this building while his mother-in-law continued becoming a, being a midwife in the back. One of the interesting things about the the two sisters, one of the sisters, Alice, Alice Horry, while she was still in high school, she would be asked to go to the San Jose Japanese Hospital to help out with patients and help the doctors. And not only that, when her mother went on home calls, home deliveries, going as far as Palo Alto and San Mateo, Alice had to do the driving because Mrs. Horry didn't know how to drive. So as a high school student, she had all these chores to do, driving her mother, going to the Saturday hospital, I mean Japanese hospital, occasionally going to O'Connor Hospital where the patients, Japanese patients, asked her to stay as an interpreter so that they could get directions and, from the nurses. Sometimes she slept overnight on the floor. So those are two examples. And as you could see, some of the audio and the video quality was pretty rough. These, these videos were just done for research uh, for the Japantown book. And they were never meant to uh, be used for broadcast or anything like that. But many times, if the, a story is strong enough, it, you, you'd be surprised how the material is, is flexible enough to be used in many other ways. And this is why, you know, I, we're encouraging all of you out there that to do your own hidden history uh, recordings, your own hidden history videos, as you saw with the, the Filipino video, uh, the Filipino group, many times just the, the smallest anecdote can be so enriching and so, so, so fun to watch. It's important to collect these stories and information, especially for people who are who are older than you, because so many of these gems could be lost forever once people depart. So um, now we're got, I'm going to kind of explain a little bit about how you could do your own hidden history videos. And unless you're working on a professional project that's going to be broadcasting, uh, broadcasted, interviewing your friends and relatives should be very casual and relaxed. And here are some tips. First. Uh, before you know, uh, interviewing a person or collecting their stories, give the person a list of questions. You know, don't just sit them down and start firing, firing questions at them. Give them, let them prepare. People will be will appreciate that. You know, you could ask them where were questions like where were you born, what was it like growing up, what, who were some of the people that influenced you, what was your favorite memory, stuff like that. Um, Whenever you film or record a person, it doesn't have to always be video, it can be audio only too. Um, have them in a comfortable, familiar setting. You know, uh, you don't have to set up lights and a microphone on a boom stand. That can be very intimidating. Just, you know, have them very comfortable. Um, 
Okay, even though this, whatever you're collecting may never be broadcasted and it may be for your own personal use, uh, still try to uh, put, uh, record them in a quiet setting. Now for some of my uh, interviews, I like, for example, with Dr. James Chan or uh, Bill and Peggy Furukawa, I interviewed them at the cafe at the 4th Street Bowl, which was really fun and casual and comfortable. But the problem was it's so noisy because there's so many people there that oftentimes when I was listening back to the video I, uh, or the audio, I was like playing it over and over to try and figure out what they were saying because there was so much background noise. Or, you know, if you're if you're filming or recording someone at their home, you know, make sure, you know, someone's not vacuuming the floors in the next room or, or washing dishes right next to the person speaking, you know, or, uh, you know, kind of look and see what's in the background. For example, I, I did a, uh, a video for Knock of Eichi Sakawa uh, um, being interviewed and Recently, I, I put together a uh, Hidden Histories video with Aichi talking, and I noticed that there's a window beside, behind Aichi, and in the window you could see the reflection of someone eating uh, lunch or something, and, um, you know, most people won't, won't notice that, or, or, although you'll, you'll probably look for it now that I've mentioned, but but as a videographer, I, I noticed that and it's kind of distracting. So kind of watch what's behind the person. Um, so anyway, um, let's go and take a look at uh, some of the, uh, we already took a look at some of the uh, hidden history videos, but uh, I wanted to say one more thing. Uh, you can also use photographs to inspire the person to talk. So not only a list of questions, you can bring along some photographs. So next we're going to see an excerpt of a video interview I did of my dad back in the 1980s. Uh, my dad was a photographer for the yearbook at the internment camp in Poston. And I, he has a collection of photographs and I wanted him to remember you know, and talk about the photographs. So here's a three minute excerpt. Now, this is also block 17, camp one, huh? Yeah. Look at that behind, yeah, that's the water tower. Oh, no, 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 oil. Oh, that's oil? Yeah. That's oil. Mm -hmm. That's a huge oil. <laughs> well, they supply all uh, the kitchen. Oh, that's the kit mess hall, huh? Mess hall and all the barracks. Mm. See? So, um, this is a ladies group. So, this is just a ladies group. They didn't have a name for no, the no, 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 no. I bet they did. Just yeah. uh, black people, a lady from the block, that's all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You recognize any, you don't have to recognize all of them, but do you recognize any of them? Oh, yeah, I recognize some of them. They're all go some of them gone, this mm -hmm. and that. Now, these are all from Gil Gilroy, Gil Gilroy, San Juan. Gilroy, San Juan, yeah. <laughs> Euro and San Juan. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you point out any of them that you recognize? Oh yeah. Uh, this is Mrs. Sakai. This one? Yeah, mm -hmm. the very end. She passed a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And she passed away too, 101. Well, who's That's that? Toyo Fuku. Toyo Fuku. Let me see if I can get rid of that glare here. There we go. Toyo Fuku right there. Uh -huh. And 101. 101, she passed away. Now, this is a beautiful photo. Oh. You know, I think I took this picture, you know that? You know the sky, those things? Mm -hmm. yeah. I did that because I use a yellow filter on my lens mm -hmm. to get the, that sky. So what's because they didn't have no such thing as color picture. <laughs> so what's this in the foreground? There's a lot of water. This is, this is what they call the ditch, or you want to call it... Uh, Canal. Mm -hmm. Oh, this was the this was the uh, canal that brought the water. Yes, from sir. Colorado and River. they made it big so the people could swim. Camp one and camp two had a big uh, canal to swim in, not the swimming pool like camp three. Mm -hmm. They were more ambitious. Or oh, this uh, that's an outdoor theater. Mm -hmm. And that's in camp one. Camp one, and I took. I'm sure I took these pictures, but. 
Uh, it's been so long that oh, I can't remember. Well, you, I find you have, I have the negatives here for those photos, so do you probably? You, I must have taken them. But we you, have the, the you know, you, I can't say I don't want to take say. Oh, I did this, I did that because I can't say that. Yeah. I forgot. Um, so this auditorium was that for all the campus people would come to this auditorium for entertainment. This outdoor auditorium, yeah, they okay. used to show movie. Oh, and those things. Mm. So everybody come over there. It's nighttime. If it's cold night, everybody used to bring a little, little like a bucket, and they put charcoal in there, and burn it right by yourself to keep warm. Oh, in okay. uh, in the winter time, and that's where they had the shibai and everything. What's shibai? Shibai is uh, like a station. So that's uh, that shows you that you can use photographs to. Uh, you know, uh, inspire people to talk about a uh, story. And um, I, I want you uh, to know that, you know, you don't have to say, oh, now I want to collect all these stories. I better go out and get a video camera or uh, whatever. No, you, I mean, yes, you could, but, you know, you could you could use your, your simple uh, smartphone to uh, uh, film your hidden history videos. In fact, Right here, someone had uh, done a comparison of the image quality between a Canon DSLR camera, which is very expensive, and the uh, image from an iPhone. So as you can see, they're not really that much different. So you can use your phone, whether it's Android or whatever, uh, to uh, film your hidden histories. You don't have to go out and buy a $5,000 camera. Uh, if, if you are going to buy anything, I, I would recommend uh, for your smartphone buying a tripod. And there's tripods you can go to Office Depot or any place like that, and they have tripods. They don't have to be fancy. I got mine for like $19 from, from Office Depot. It doesn't, it's not as fancy as the one in this picture, but it does, it does the job because you don't want to just try to prop up your phone with using books or whatever, because it inevitably it will fall over. Um, when, you're, when you're recording or filming a person, try not to be too far away from the person because you know, you're probably using the built-in microphone and you, know, you don't want too much of an echo or the, the sound to be too soft. However, if you, you, know, if you feel like it, you, there are a lot of, microphone attachments you can get for your uh, uh, smartphone and uh, to in increase the, uh, the quality of the audio. Now I'm going to mention three mistakes that uh, a lot of people do when they when they film and I, I mention these only so that when, when you do record your hidden histories uh, the quality is a little bit better. First of all don't don't put the person in front of a bright light source. I've seen so many videos where they film a person and the window is right behind the person and, or a, a light is right behind the person. And what happens is, as you see in this picture, the camera, get, the camera gets full. It doesn't know what, what the exposure should be. And inevitably, it darkens everything to try and compensate for the light. And the person ends up looking like a silhouette. So another thing is, you know, when you have a bright light in, in the picture or the uh, frame of the video, you're going to get flare and that's, you know, that's going to ca cause a lot of distractions. So you don't want light behind the person or anywhere within the frame. Uh, the third, my third tip is, okay, you don't have a light in the frame or uh, nearby to cause flare. And yet your image looks, looks, still looks bad. What's wrong? Well, usually it's because your lens is dirty. Uh, I've seen so many people as they're handling their phones, their thumb or their fingers over the lens and leaves a fingerprint. And then when you go to take your picture, you're wondering, gee, why does it look so bad? Well, usually it's, it's uh, because your lens is dirty. Now, after you, um, after you record your video or uh, just or audio only if that's if that's what you prefer you would download 
everything to your computer. And what do you do after that? Well, you'll have to tune in to our upcoming episodes here on Hidden History, and we'll talk more about that. So now, I think it's, it's time we should. Yeah, thank you, Kurt. I've been guilty of the dirty lens many, many times myself, so. Okay, so we'll um, start a Q&A process here. And I do have access to the uh, chat. I'm not seeing any questions. And Susan, I'm actually looking at the Facebook. I'm not doing Netflix, so. <laughs> but um, yeah, if anybody has any questions out there you'd like to ask. Let's see, so. Chris. Chris, I could, uh, if I could say something, um, oh, sure, for, for our project, Hidden Histories project, we really wanted to do more engagement with the community in public, in real, real world, not virtual. That was kind of the idea. And because of COVID-19, of course, and shelter in place, that really threw a big monkey wrench into all of it. And so one of the uh, things we're trying to do with a program like this that I really appreciate the museum helping us do is to try to make some connections with the community and have people think about doing their own history and other projects like that. And then as we progress with our augmented reality art pieces, they actually see those pieces and become inspired. And some people might even want to take on that as a, uh, as a project. Um, so we really want to encourage people through these kind of programming, because even though we're in shelter in place still or modified shelter in place soon. And so we're going to have a couple of more episodes uh, with Kurt's help, focusing on more specific things like Highlandville, Chinatown or Pinoy Town. We're still trying to cook things up, but it's to try to engage uh, the public, too. So it's not just a separate project with artists, if that makes sense to people. Thank you, Tom. Also, you know, um, uh, one of the things that would be really great is for people to, uh, you know, find out, like, you know, to, and tell us, you know, were you born in Japantown or were your parents or your relatives born in Japantown? You know, do you have family ties to the Highlandville Chinatown or family ties to the Sixth Street uh, Pinoy Town? Uh, anything that you have is probably really interesting to us. Sometimes people, uh, you know, don't think that their story is really important, but um, they're of historical and human interest. And so please contact us. Okay, so we did get a, a, a question come in and it's from our friend Ralph Pierce. Thank you so much, Ralph. Um, and Ralph asks us, uh, uh, what our favorite hidden histories, what our favorite hidden histories are and why. And so, uh, Kurt, did you? Oh, my, my favorite hidden histories are the uh, anecdotes and stories from people uh, because uh, they just touch my heart or they'll make me laugh. <laughs> you know, they're just, they're just, what, I'm just always amazed when people come out become they're just natural story people are natural storytellers whether they realize it or not and when person a person is remembering something there's something that kicks in and they just come along for me one of the um my favorite hidden histories is just the the fact that you know when i moved to san jose japan town area um i thought that it was just it's always been japan town and I found out that it used to be called Chinatown. And so that's when I learned about the Highlandville Chinatown, but um, meeting Robert Ragsack, who was an elder in the Filipino community and who actually grew up in Japantown, um, hearing him talk about the Sixth Street Pinoy Town is an amazing uh, hidden history. I, I bet you most of the people that, you know, eat in Japantown regularly have never heard of that. And um, that's one of the things we want to really elevate. Mm -hmm. Oh, also, I think one of the things that I really like are the little stories that um, show the interactions between Japanese Americans and Filipino Americans or between uh, Japanese Americans and Chinese Americans. Um, I think those stories are really moving to us. 
um, and um, they're they're really heartwarming and mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I really like those. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And because when we first started this project, we were thinking they'll be pretty separate. There'll be somebody talking about the Chinese and Chinese American history and Filipino American history and Japanese American history. But most of the advisors that, that you saw in our project that uh, we get a lot of uh, inspiration from, a lot of the stories that come to their mind are exactly what Susan is saying, is the interactions between the two different communities. And and they're very, very moving, I think. And, and I think right now, especially, uh, it helps you feel much more hope and much more connection and much more understanding what a community really means. And um, to me, that's been very inspiring. And um, I think uh, through our series here, with Kurt's help, I think we can probably share some of those stories. We actually have some interviews where they talk about it and they're, they're, they're really neat. I mean, and as uh, we, we share more of these stories, I think people will realize how Sixth Street is kind of like the intersection, the confluence of of all the cultures, because uh, you had Chinese restaurants there, you had Filipino businesses, you had uh, Japanese boarding houses there. And, um, you know, of course, now Sixth Street is <laughs> changing drastically with the seven story development going in. But uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a very, for me, it's a very exciting part of Japan capital. That it's been really, really, uh, fun to learn more about. Okay, uh, we did have another question. It was from uh, Monica, and she asks uh, how the artists are learning to do the augmented reality. Okay, um, well, that's that's a great question. So um, I think augmented reality, as uh, people talk about it in Silicon Valley, uh, sometimes is viewed just as something that people buy. You know, you buy a product or a game that has it, um, already implemented for you, but I think the way that Tomiko looks at it is that you know it's a it's a it's a something that could uh, give people a creative outlet and creative expression, and that's the way we're looking at it in our project. So um, the way we originally had envisioned it, we were going to bring Tomiko out. Um, she lives in Munich right now, but we were going to bring her out to Japantown, and over a course of a week have a series of workshops where we would train the artists in uh, how to translate their art into uh, digital media. And, um, but because of the pandemic, uh, we couldn't do that. We couldn't bring her and we can't get together with all the artists. So uh, Tomiko has been working on making step-by-step -step tutorials to introduce the artists, some of whom have no digital media experience but to introduce them into the concepts of, of augmented reality. And um, so the artists have been going through these step-by-step uh, -step tutorials and have been uh, talking with Tomiko about, you know, what, what are the feature sets of the uh, AR uh, app? And simultaneously, we're also trying to uh, train, there are some younger artists who are part of our artist pool who actually have some digital media experience and maybe not AR experience, but um, but who are less familiar with the history of uh, the Japantown area. And so we're also doing historical training. So we're doing historical training and AR technology training. And, and then it looks like they'd love to see a preview of some of, of some of this work. Do you want to comment on that? Oh, well, um, we're kind of in a process right now where we're uh, working with the artists to uh, produce um, a proposal for their concept. And then we're gonna have the artists um, sketch up their ideas for AR, um, you know, in whatever medium they have. Because we have, we have uh, artists who do painting, who do drawing. We have some that do uh, collages. Um, and so anyway, we're going to uh, do that. And then at some point, we're going to turn them into um, AR installations and, and get them up in the air. But right now, we don't have, um, uh, we're not that far along yet. So we don't have anything that we can, we can show you yet. But that's why the Brush the Sky uh, installation is, is kind of our proof of concept. And um, if you uh, take a look at our website, you can see more 
photos of what Brush the Sky looks like in Japantown. And I think, um, you know, as soon as uh, people can, you know, stop sheltering in place at some point in the future, then people can go look at that too. Okay. We had a couple of comments uh, from uh, Carol and Charlene, and they uh, wanted to thank the Hidden Histories uh, Project for you know, being dedicated and sharing the information. And uh, uh, both praised it for being uh, educational and meaningful. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Carol and Charlene. Yeah, I think we're probably ready to uh, wind down here. Well, well yeah, maybe so one, I'm sorry, Chris, but if, Kurt, if you, did you want to mention ideas for future episodes, really brief? Oh, yeah. Yes, Come, coming up, uh, we have, uh, uh, we'll have an episode on Highlandville with uh, Brenda and Connie, and they're very excited. To, uh, you're, that's going to be an exciting episode because they, the two of them have so many stories, so much information, and so much enthusiasm that uh, mm -hmm. you'll have to tune in. And of course, that goes equally for the uh, Filipino uh, episode with uh, Tony and Robert. Um, and uh, I mean, Robert alone could probably do like a five-hour <laughs> episode, but we'll have to we'll have to keep them down to maybe only like five hundred stories instead of five thousand. <laughs> so, uh, and then I. Uh, there is uh, the web address for our, our website. If you have any questions or comments there, there's the uh, uh, email address to contact us. So, so Tom, or originally uh, the project was supposed to wind up in December, but because of COVID-19 and everything, I guess we're, it might go into next year. Yeah, it might. Uh, we're stretching it out a bit, and um, it we might not be done until the beginning of uh, 2021. But it depends on how fast and how much we can, um, how quickly the artists are trained. And some of them are pretty, moving pretty fast. So, so we'll see. I mean, that's why it's a little bit unclear. But I know people would like to see some previews. So we'll do the best we can. Okay. I, I would encourage everyone to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Again, uh, in YouTube, do a search on Hidden Mysteries of San Jose, Japantown, um, and subscribe because uh, we'll be putting out at least one video a week, so you don't want to miss out. Some of them will be like only a few seconds long, some will be a little bit longer, and, and you'll never know what they're about, but they'll always be very enjoyable. So I, I see a question uh, from Ellen Vep. Have you contacted any of the depend, uh, descendants of families who had businesses in J-Town back in the day? Um, that's a great question. We've been uh, contacting some people and we, we know that uh, your family had a business in the Japantown area. And uh, one of our artists um, is Carol Rast who grew up in Japantown. And she's been uh, giving us uh, ideas for uh, people to talk to also. but. Um, please contact us and um, we're, we're collecting a lot of information and, and there are, I know there are a lot of stories that would inspire the artists um, to, you know, in terms of uh, conceptualizing their artwork. So yeah, I think the descendants of the, the J-Town and Highlandville and Pinoy Town uh, communities are really important to this project. Mm -hmm. And I see one last question and I'll just, uh, uh, repeat about the timeline. The project started in January 2020 officially, and it was supposed to end in December 2020, but because of the shelter in place and COVID-19 and all of that, uh, we're asking for an extension, which will be uh, granted to us, um, to be able to go all the way till June 2021. I mean, our intention is actually to get it done before then, because it will. Uh, we will have to raise some more money so we can have great people like Kurt working for us. Um, but uh, that, that's our timeline, if, if, if that gives you an idea. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I'd like to thank everybody for their, their questions. That was, that was great. 
Uh, let's see, so go ahead and um, I think that, uh, hold on, lost my place. Sorry, I'm a little new to this. So, uh, so if, you, if you haven't already done so for our Facebook page, if you could uh, uh, please like us. Uh, we're going to go ahead and have future programs uh, through Facebook Live, and I hope uh, everybody's enjoyed this. And uh, when we do have our programs, we'll push it out to um, uh, Facebook and uh, or other social media through Instagram and, and Twitter. Uh, the Jams website, um, I think many of you've been there, but it's uh, jamsj.org. A lot of information there. Um, so supporting, uh, JAMS is a nonprofit museum, and so we do need support. And so at the, uh, in the upper right of the, uh, of the JAMS webpage is there's a support button. And then if you click on that, um, it will bring up this image here. Next page, if we could go to the next, please. So it brings up that uh, the box, and from there you can go ahead and you can donate. Uh, Jams relies a lot on donations to, to just keep us going. So um, again, if you'd like to help us keep this message, uh, continue to, to to work on it, is um, please consider a donation to the museum. Um, also, uh, from this page, uh, you you can go ahead uh, uh, become a member. And for those of you who are members currently, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Uh, if you're not a member of JAMS, uh, you know, please consider becoming one. And uh, we can also do some volunteer uh, from that uh, donate or from that, that page. And what we're looking at here right now, um, this is also on the support page, but it's uh, an entry for the Amazon Smile. Uh, so for those of you who are not uh, familiar with Smile, is uh, a half percent of your uh, the entire uh, cost of your qualified purchases, and that goes to your organization of choice. And um, if you could, if you go to Amazon Smile, um, and if you select the Japanese American Museum of San Jose, uh, we would really appreciate it because this really helps uh, uh, fund our our uh, organization. So uh, thank you so much, uh, all of you for who joined up, for taking the time, participate and participate in our program. Uh, I guess I want to thank Kurt, Susan, and Tom for your presentations. Uh, but also would like to acknowledge the uh, Hidden History of San Jose, Japantown team and artists uh, for all your hard work and dedication. This is a, uh, just an outstanding uh, a project that's going on right now. Uh, so uh, behind the scenes, and again, this is something that's a little bit new. We, uh, in the past, we've just done a lot of the uh, uh, programming at Jams and unable to do this, and so uh, do it at this point. So through these video streams, these live streams, um, we've had a lot of people helping us out. And um, Sydney Casson, um, she's monitoring the Facebook. She's uh, helped uh, produce the program. Uh, Sydney joined us at the last minute, and so uh, thank you so much. It was really a uh, big help. Uh, Momo Cha is our uh, website. Uh, she works on the website. I call her the website mistress. I don't know if that's a good thing, but she just she uh, helps out so much and, and pretty much runs it for for jams. And she spent hours and hours uh, getting the, the website uh, prepared for this uh, for our live streaming. And so Momo. Uh, we appreciate you. And um, also for Michael Sarah for producing. Thank you, Michael. Uh, it was really big. So uh, we really couldn't have done this without you. So uh, live streaming, as I said, something a little bit new to Jams. Um, we're tweaking on it and working on it. Um, we hope to have many, many more in the future. And uh, if, you know what we do, we hope that you'll join us. So. Uh, thank you so much for, for everybody for uh, doing this, our live stream here. Uh, be safe, and we hope to see you sometime soon. Okay, thanks. Oh, okay. <laughs>